I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of all of us, Professor Weller for uh, his very fine paper, and particularly for cutting very elegantly 15 minutes from its length. And I see on the top he had 45 minutes, and he managed to present it in 30, which is really an excellent achievement. Um, I'd like to respond very quickly to some of the points he made, if I may, and uh, suggest some linkages with uh, some of my own work uh, internationally and in relation to legal theory that I think might uh, be helpful. Uh, I liked Professor Weller's, as he put it, problematizing the secular. I thought that was the right move to make. Uh, and he mentioned that the term can be, as he put it, kind of invisible. I think he's right. I'd like to suggest, however, there's a whole group of terms that go along with secular that also are largely invisible, but predispose us to particular placement of religions in contemporary politics and culture in ways that tend to bracket them out of their appropriate public place. In that article that he read to you, and there's many of them from the international documents, religion is not just the right to hold a belief in private, but the right to manifest it, teach it, and disseminate it. And this is true not only in the international law, but in the domestic law of many countries in their jurisprudence. That's the kind of understanding they have of religion. In other words, it's not just private, it has a place in the public sphere. This is very important because I want to suggest now that a whole lot of our language is kind of post-enlightenment privatization and marginalization of religion. And let me run through some of those that I think would be parallel terms to the one Professor Weller has helpfully explicated with respect to secular. We are, I think, most correctly now understood to be moving into a new phase that I'd like to call the post-secular. And I've written extensively on this, and to my great delight, last week in Melbourne, I listened to a South African scholar commenting on a German theologian from Munich who's writing about the post-secular in early Judaism. So he's looked back thousands of years to find sources in biblical times for uh, a move towards uh, out of the idea of theocratic Assyrian religion. The Jews had to formulate a way of being themselves in light of the powerful Assyrian kingdoms. And then he compared it to my work in law, which was interesting, um, because I don't know anything about this German scholar, and he knows nothing about my work, and none of us have used the same sources, but apparently we've articulated a very similar framework, and it fits, I think, rather nicely with what Professor Weller was describing. So we're now moving into a phase that this scholar, Christo Lombard, is referring to as the post-secular. Uh, now in this, we have to rethink our language. For example, the language of faith and the language of belief. It's all too common for religious believers to refer to other people as unbelievers. Mm -hmm. And this creates a division that is in fact philosophically and theologically unsound. It's also politically unwise. Why? Well, in fact, everybody's a believer. The question isn't whether they believe, but what they believe in. This is very significant because everybody, including religious people, speaks about this group of unbelievers, and that lets contemporary atheists and agnostics rather off the hook in terms of their belief systems. Secondly, uh, everybody is in a community of faith of some sort. Um, Cardinal Newman, the great Catholic um, thinker of the 19th century, said to act is to assume, and to assume is to have faith. So not only is every citizen around us a believer, they also have faith of some sort. What my friend, the late uh, philosopher Thomas Langan, referred to as natural faith. Um, this is the way we function every day, with natural faith. And we shouldn't make of this, uh, we shouldn't make this invisible. This faith matters because our faith commitments to things that we don't articulate still frame our life in the world and our relationships with one another. Um, recent writers have talked about a crisis of contemporary liberalism. I'm thinking here of Horowitz, his book, The Agnostic Age, and a recent book called The Politics of Virtue by John Milbank and Adrian Paps. Both of these writers have talked about virtue in relation to the crisis of liberalism. 
the liberalism cannot generate from within its own resources, really, what is needed for virtue. And in the tradition I'm a part of, Roman Catholicism, the four cardinal virtues were justice, wisdom, moderation, and courage. And the three theological virtues were faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of those was understood to be love, which perfected the natural order. The natural order was very important within the writings of Said Nursi uh, in his Rizali Nur, his great commentary on the, on the Quran, and very important to the entire Greco-Roman tradition that is the basis for a lot of our contemporary political thinking. The cosmos in which we live is ordered meaning. It's not disorder and it's not chaos, which was fragmentation. And this notion of order and meaning in nature and in interrelationships between human persons undergirds a particular approach to the life of politics, to the idea whether we're civic friends of one another under the notion of civic friendship, also of virtue. So what happens in this contemporary splitting of all of this enlightenment language is that we play into secularism, the ideology coined first of all in 1851 by George Jacob Holyoke, which was set up to drive out of public influence religions. Uh, it was not a neutral thing as he claimed it was, and later encyclopedias <coughs> have said it was, repeating that original error. It was in fact an ideology of marginalization. Contemporary law, and you'll have to take my word for this, tends to respect religion for trivial matters. When it becomes public matters, like funding, accreditation issues, um, public conscience accommodation, secularism is less tolerant of religion. But when it comes to wearing a cross or maybe being able to refuse to make a cake, maybe, uh, you may get some respect. In Canada, the cases for individual religious expression, like the wearing of a kirpan by a, a member of the Sikh religion, or the usage of a sukkot, a prayer tent, by a Jewish person. Those were respected, but when it came to the role of parents in directing their children in public education, that wasn't respected. Right now there's a case or, argued in December 2017, just a couple of months ago before the Canadian Supreme Court, that is of extraordinary importance for Western law. It's called Trinity Western University. And it deals with whether a religious university can have state recognized accreditation for a law school. There's no religiously accredited law schools in Canada. This would be the first. I teach in one in Australia. So I'm interested in this case because its implications are huge. The argument is that because Trinity Western has a community covenant, a religious covenant that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage, therefore it should not be allowed to have a law school because accreditation is deemed to be a public thing. This is a very dangerous argument because if it applies for public accreditation of an academic law school, it would also apply for charitable recognition of religious charities for any religion that still had the traditional male-female idea of marriage, they would find themselves outsiders to this new compact. And that ought to worry all of us, no matter what our view is on same-sex marriage. So the public um, is stripped of religion, that we call that religious marginalization. We don't have the separation of church and state as such in Australia or in Canada or in South, South Africa. What you have is something more nuanced and more important. You have the cooperation of church and state. Now what that does is it recognizes a jurisdictional difference between the state and the church. You don't want either ruling the other, but it suggests they can cooperate. A strict separation regime tends to play into secularism's project of excluding religion from public influence. Charles Taylor has said there's two kinds of approach to society. Some version, and Professor Weller referred to this in his paper a few times, of Marxist-Leninist vanguard partyism, where the few know what's best for everyone else, or, he says, civil society, in which we recognize the divergent and, and um, cooperating dimensions of, of society. Under the Catholic tradition in, in European law, in a general sense, subsidiarity is the term that's used to explain this idea of local ordering, where we build things up from the small, from the neighborhood, from the community. 
I mention this because Professor Weller's paper leads us to think about the secular realm, or the, what I prefer to call the public sphere. I don't think the term secular carries much useful weight anymore, so I tend not to use it. For it because it's because it's confusing. So I refer to the public sphere as the sphere of competing belief systems, including non-religious beliefs, okay? They have a place at the public table, but they don't have a right to dominate it. This means that religious communities need to learn that public language as best they can, and the non-religious public participants need to become more respectful of religious articulation. That seems to be one of the tax, tasks ahead of us. In South Africa in 2010, as it was said in the introduction, I was a drafter of the South African Charter of Rights and Freedoms, along with other people. And this built on a provision that was very unusual in the South African Constitution, which allowed for the creation of additional charters done by civil society, not by government. Then th these charters would represent the best thought of the groups drafting them. And in this case, years of work went into this document called the South African Charter of Religious Rights and Freedoms, and you can see it on the internet. This happened in a contemporary society that understood that the church was not running the state in South Africa, but in a society that under understood itself to be, as it calls itself, <coughs> the rainbow nation. I've been in three countries now that claim to be the most diverse on earth. <laughs> Australia is now the third, I saw from the introductory <laughs> film. Canada also claims this and so does South Africa. But the point is that South Africa has done what Australia hasn't done, Canada hasn't done, Europe hasn't done. It's expressly tried to figure out how to involve civil society in constitutional development. Through section 234 of their constitution, they created a framework for civil society to get involved in creating documents. And my time's up. I set myself a short time because I want you to have question and answers. So can I just conclude with this question? Is the secular meaningless? Yes and no. Yes, if it's used as a shorthand for post-enlightenment confusion and division. No, if by it we want to study it historically and what it meant. Essentially, as the order of time, secularum was about time, not eternity. But somehow that verticality tipped at the Enlightenment and became a division between the public and the religions. George Orwell understood three terms to be meaningless, and he said they tended towards the kind of Stalinist or Marxist authoritarianism that sadly he was well aware of and wrote about in various ways. Those terms that were, he said, meaningless and tended towards authoritarianism should interest us because we use them all the time. Values, equality, and progressive. He said they're all meaningless words. They're mere wind and they corrupt politics. Professor Weller's paper was helpful in giving us some background to certain necessary qualification, clarification. He's pointed us towards uh, ways of living together, overcoming the hidden anti-religious bigotry that can sometimes undergird some of our movements and language in contemporary politics and sociology and so on. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to again thank Professor Weller for his paper and then uh, open it to questions from the floor. Thank you. So now we've got some time here. If you've got a question, uh, please uh, make it a question. Sometimes questions become speeches. <laughs> yes, John. Well, just a question on the sort of contemporary situation we find ourselves in now. It seems to me that the case is that post enlightenment, Christianity played a role in removing itself from the secular sphere, particularly in the early 20th century, the evangelicals in the United States that made retreat over the Darwin's evolutionary theories. And those challenges seem to be facing contemporary Islam as it moves into Western society. What got any reflections on just the way in which, given that the great religions have played a role in shaping civilization, which is sometimes the containers, that Christianity, or as Islam faces the issues itself too, may inject themselves in the contemporary situation. Either of you on that. Where is the way forward in, in what have I stated something that's reasonable, and where's the way forward? 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think one of the things I would want to emphasize, and I very much agree about your terminology, public, um, in my own sort of work and writing, that's what I tend also to use. But I think that it's still necessary, it is certainly necessary um, in the quotes unquote Muslim world, but I think it's also necessary still within the Christian world to uh, critique the relationship between religion and power structures. And um, this is what I was trying to point out towards the end when I was also citing Fethullah Gulen as a different way of thinking within um, is Islam uh, than many Muslims, uh, Islamists articulate about where the wish in order to bring about the spread of Muslim and Islamic values is to capture the state and then that will do it. Um, and Fatullah Gulen has this contrary argument. Uh, the state is not necessary for Islam. And I, st I would want to argue that I think you know, part of the difficulty is that also for Christians, is that Christians have still not fully worked out of that history of dependence upon uh, state power um, and not develop sufficient confidence, you know, in a sense. If we, if we believe, in, if we're confident enough in our own truth claims and the validity of those things, not just for ourselves as private persons, but having something to share with the world, then we need, in a sense, more self-confidence is needed. Now, I'm not talking here about naivety, because I know there are also those movements you know, that deliberately seek to exclude religious voices. Um, but I, I still think there's a task to be done um, and that some of the old or apparently old debates and issues around, for example, in my context, established church or, or not, um, are pertinent ones also today. Um, John, if I may, I think <coughs> one thing we need to attend to is the limit of the state. The state has a jurisdiction and so does <coughs> law. Um, and the, what's happened is the relationship between the proper jurisdictions of religion and the state and, and politics, politics and law, has, has got lost. So what we have, in the words of an Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, is we have a st the hypertrophy of the, of the law. Law is growing and growing and growing and becoming, in a, f a strange way, yeah, a kind of authority priest, structure that is very increasingly religious. But it's priests. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that needs to be kept in mind as well. There's a question, a couple more questions here, yes. Yes, yes. Um, I'd just like to say it's very you know, relevant uh, as an issue in Australia at the moment about religious freedom. In fact, we have a commission talking into religious freedom as a result of marriage equality legislation passing very recently. I'm just wondering if you could tell us from the English context mm. where there has been marriage equality for quite a long time, and several years now, have issues of religious freedom emerged in Britain? And perhaps you'd like to comment a little bit further on those issues arising about the presentation of Canada? Yes, I mean, we've had. Uh same-sex civil partnership for a long time. Uh, Same-sex marriage has been the more recent um, development. And um, I mean, interestingly, in some ways, the debates uh, that were played out around partnership have now uh, have shifted a gear around the debates when it came to marriage. And many people who were against, on religious grounds, same-sex civil partnership originally, have actually come to either accept and or defend partnership, but draw the line, have sought to draw the line in relation to marriage because that of having a different kind of conceptual um, set of meanings associated with it, um, which, have, which are religiously infused, in particular Christian traditions. Now, I think this has come to then the, the issue around, of course, exemptions and requirements and so on. Um, broadly speaking, uh, in England, I mean, part of the interesting issue there is that in the Church of England, which remains the established church, it is not possible to conduct uh, same-sex weddings. Okay, So even if the incumbent of a parish wished to do so, you know, part of the settlement is that the Church of England as a whole does not do so. In churches like my own, in the Baptist tradition, 
um, because that has a devolved church polity, um, actually the law recognizes the possibility for an individual congregation. And the general presumption is it isn't conducted, but it allows an individual congregation, not the minister, because in our policy it's the congregation who decides, uh, to register itself as being able to conduct same-sex marriages. So the impact of this, I think, is all, and the perception of it among religious groups also varies according to where you are in the spectrum of religion, not just on the issue itself, but also how your own understanding of the church, the corporate nature of, of the church operates, and certainly as far as Christian churches are concerned. Yeah. There's been a serious uh, dislocation of, of uh, the theory of civil society in both the UK and in Canada. In the UK, the Catholic Church adoption mm -hmm. agencies had to close yeah. because they didn't want to do give adoptions to same-sex parenting in accordance with their concept of what a family should be. Um, similarly, in two very important cases that were part of a set of four that went to the European court, the OIDA group of cases, um, a marriage commissioner in, in a case and a counselor both found themselves outside of this new conception of the public requirement. Similarly, in Canada, we've had accreditation cases, Trinity Western being the example I gave you. We've had individual service providers, as in the CAKE cases in Northern Ireland and in, in the United States that we're waiting to hear from the U.S. Supreme Court on. And the California judge just recently ruled somebody didn't have to make a cake that was artistic because it involves speech, which I think is the right decision. I wrote a piece for ABC on this that uh, under the title, Who Should Celebrate Marriage? And the answer is those who believe that that's a marriage, no one else. You can't force a population to celebrate what they don't believe. That's ludicrous. But that has become the rhetoric because what's happened is the claim for inclusion into marriage has now become a claim for domination of marriage as an idea, and that's a mistake. Somewhere the political and religious movement articulation has been, has it, people have been failing to make the distinction between allowed to be married and other people being required to acknowledge it. No one claimed when the uh, idea was, we want marriage equality, quote unquote, that that would include the sole claim to this being marriage for everybody else. Somehow, the activism has, has gone to the second category, that this is now marriage for all public purposes, for everybody, and that's a big legal step, and one that I think is now going to be the subject of pushback. In Australia, where you don't have very good religious liberty protections, you need an act, a uh, uh, Commonwealth Act, parallel to the Disability Act, the Age Act, and the uh, Sexual Discrimination Act. Um, those things are all in the same international document, but you don't have religious protection at the Commonwealth level. That's, very, that's a big gap. So I argued before the Ruddick Commission last week that you should have such a federal act, and it should have a place for accommodation and tolerance. Accommodation, the root of the word accommodation, is to make comfortable. And right now, there's a lot of religious people and communities that feel alienated from some of these new movements. I mean, to add to that, in the UK, we, religion and belief is a strand of our Equality and Human Rights Act. Um, so the issue then becomes either competition or balancing or hierarchies between the different strands or so-called protected characteristics under the um, uh, Equality and Human Rights Act. And there's also quite a lot of tension within that because it's an attempt to hold the two things together between an equalities focus and a human rights focus because these don't necessarily deliver the same outcomes. Um, interestingly, apropos your earlier comments about religion and belief, uh, one of the good things about the UK equality and human rights framework is that it treats of religion or belief yeah. uh, precisely in order, in a way, to um, have within the full spectrum uh, non-religious beliefs, if you want to put it that way, but things by which people orientate their lives in a serious and significant way, um, and doesn't make a precise line of separation between that and, and religion. But that then gives other issues for more structured religion, I think, for the recognition of you know, religious organizations as distinct from individuals in terms of their religion or belief.
Just a final point on equality, a, really a one-liner to think about. Diversity is prior to equality. And we know this in law because we have all kinds of contexts in which we allow discrimination. We allow age discrimination, we allow disability discrimination, and we allow gender or sex discrimination, and we have to. And I could explain that to you in e easily in simple ways. The first one with respect to age, we don't let children drive cars. Um, there's a good reason for that age discrimination. And you can do discrimination. Discrimination is essential to human freedom and to the reality of communities. But somehow that Orwellian insight about equality being a dazzling language has made us fail to think about context. And context is essential to properly functioning free society. Now we've got another question at the front here. Well, I don't think I would want to ban tolerance because that in itself becomes part of another set of issues. However, I think I would want to argue in that to argue as I think I'm trying to do and make the distinction clearly between, for example, religious tolerance and religious freedom. Religious freedom is a positive statement of something. Tolerance is in itself already has, you know, of course, there are certain, there are preferable things about tolerance to intolerance, but um, I personally avoid the language of tolerance um, as far as possible um, in, in kind of my own work. Um, and so I would very much argue along your lines for other terminologies um, being important, not just for the sake of the terminology, but for the substance of what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to keep going all afternoon, but we can't. Um, I've got a job to do here, and part of that is to be a bit intolerant in terms of, in terms of questions. So I'd like us to, uh, without further ado, if you would, um, uh, if Doug, Dr. Douglas Golding is here, yes, would he come up uh, and he's going to present a small gift in appreciation to Paul Weller on behalf of Affinity. And here's the small gift I think behind you. In front of the, yes, <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, excellent. And then, once the photos are done, if we could, if I could call on Paul Weller to present a gift to Jim Mead. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like a copy of your card if I yes. to do so I can get a yes. So, <laughs> you come to the right place, and uh, there we are. Thank you. I think we have to pause here for a moment. Okay, and if I could call on Ahmed Polet now, to the executive director of Affinity, to present the closing remarks. <laughs> 